Hello everybody and welcome back to the law of tort for the SQE specification. We are now going to move away from the basic introduction to the study of tort and start to examine the first major tortious element of the course, which is of course an examination of negligence. We're going to be paying special attention in this video to the concept of a duty of care in relation to negligence. And then we will talk about the concept of the breach of a duty of care as well as some of the subsidiary issues in more detail in future lessons time. So as we've seen here, I've just laid out the complete specification for us. This is what the SQE asks of you to uh, essentially know before your assessments. The first major topic is, of course, the concept of negligence. We have to cover the idea of negligence, the standard of care, and the idea of breaching the duty of care. We will then also have to examine the concept of causation and remoteness, as well as the principles of remedies for personal injury claims. And then we will do pure economic loss, negligent misstatement and psychiatric harm before finishing with employer's liability. That is the essential roadmap for this series of videos. So as I've mentioned in this video, what we're going to be doing is discussing the concept of the duty of care. And this really brings us to the introduction to negligence section in this video, because ultimately, when we think about the most litigated area of tort, the most important area of tort, we're inevitably going to be examining the idea of negligence. Negligence is the most important tort uh, for any law student to understand and to know. Every single textbook, every single uh, module at a university course, every single SQE specification, as it may be, will cover negligence first. This is a partially owing to its frequent use in litigation. However, this hasn't always been the case because the tort of negligence is actually something that has developed as a unique and com a unique, sorry, and complex set of rules in the latter part of the 20th century. This is almost entirely from the common law and almost entirely as a result from judicial decision making. So let's think about how we define negligence. It's probably a good idea to work out how to define negligence now and then to unpack each of the individual elements of this definition as time goes on. OK, according to Gillica from 2023, negligence is defined as a breach of a legal duty to take reasonable care that results in damage to the claimant. This here is a, um, a very concise, uh, and a, in my, my opinion, a brilliant definition of negligence. It is perfect in every single way. Why is it perfect in every single way? Because not only does it explain what negligence ultimately is, but it also gives us the key elements of negligence. The two most important of which is the breach of a legal duty to take reasonable care. In that first part of this passage, we are defining two elements of the tort of negligence. There is the duty to take reasonable care, the legal duty to take reasonable care. Shortened down, this is, of course, the legal duty of care. And then there is a breach of said legal duty of care. So that is the first two elements of the tort of negligence. Then the final elements of the tort of negligence are defined in the second part of this passage. That results in the damage to the claimant. This is talking about causation, and we will get to causation in future lessons time and the ways in which we define tests for causation. But fundamentally, this is a very good way in which we can define the concept of negligence. With this in mind, we can see that negligence requires a certain number of elements. OK, this is sometimes referred to and as I refer to it as the sort of equation of negligence, the kind of elements that have to be there in order to equal negligence. OK, and so the equation of negligence looks like this. The equation of negligence tells us that we have to have a duty of care for this duty of care to then have a breach and then for the breach of the duty of care to cause damage to the claimant. This all collectively together results in negligence. Now, fundamentally, some people may define and split causation into two and define it as causation in fact, as well as causation in law, i.e. remoteness. 
but ultimately these fall under the umbrella of causation um in this in this equation but you could you could theoretically divide them into two in fact the uh, in fact the sqe specification actually does do that we talk about remoteness and loss separately to causation um in in this in this series but we're going to begin therefore with the element of um the duty of care so the defendant in these cases must have a duty of care to the claimant, a duty to take reasonable care. We'll get to where the idea and the concept of reasonableness um, really crops up in, in, in future slides. But ultimately, this is what um, the first uh, point of proving uh, a, a claim of negligence requires. It requires somebody to have a duty of care, a legal duty to take reasonable care. That particular duty must have been breached by the defendant. They must have acted in a way that falls below what would be considered a reasonable standard of what that duty of care requires of them. So in order to understand a breach of a duty, we have to think about the standard of care, the level of care that somebody should go to in order to um, be performing their actions in a way that is non-negligent, essentially. If you can then show that they have, they have acted below this standard of care and therefore as a result of which have breached the duty of care, that said breach of duty of care must have causally led to the damage in question. Now this is sometimes uh, done through multiple different um, tests and multiple different claims depending on the claim that we're talking about. Often we make reference to something known as the but for test which essentially asks the question but for the breach of of the duty of care would the claimant still have suffered the loss and the damage that they are claiming was the result of the breach if the answer to that question is no if they wouldn't have um, suffered from the damage if the breach hadn't have happened then we would conclude that it was the breach that was the main cause uh, or at least causally the the resulting um, cause of the uh, of the tortious activity of the damage in question shall i say so one of the things that I want to just dispel as a myth straight away is this idea that negligence has some kind of relationship with intentionality. Um, one of the most important things to note is that negligence doesn't necessarily imply that a defendant had acted intentionally in their conduct. In fact, we have a whole separate series of torts that are intentional torts. And so they are defined as separate to the rest of the major areas of the law of tort. Um, negligence does not assume intent, nor does it require intent for liability to be found. So even if an individual says that they did not intend to have been negligent in their actions, that would not provide for a sufficient defense to the uh, idea of uh, being liable in the law of tort. For the most part, and as we will see, um, claims of negligence will be accidental. Somebody accidentally does something, which therefore leads to them having, where they automatically already had a, a duty of care, but the, the, them doing something has auto, uh, led to them, also led to them um, causing damage to a claimant. And so in doing so, they've breached their duty of care. And so even if it is an accident, it is still negligence. Let's start talking about the history of the duty of care itself then. Let's start talking about the duty of care in more detail. So, as I mentioned early on, the concept of negligence being such a popular area of litigation for the law of tort is actually a relatively new phenomenon. It's something that's really only started to expand into the late 1800s, early 1900s. And the reason for this is because there was a very limited definition of what constituted a duty of care. Historically, the duty of care was limited to contractual relationships. Okay, So a legal duty to take care would arise in circumstances where an individual in question was under a contractual obligation to have a duty of care to the other party within the contract. And so the scope and reach of a duty of care would have to be challenged in order for us to break this narrative that the duty of care is such a limited uh, and is so limited in scope. And this is what happens when we see arguably the most famous case in English law, this being the case of Donoghue and Stevenson. Fundamentally, we'll get to um, 
we will get to the principles of Donahue and Stevenson in a second. But fundamentally, the case of Donahue and Stevenson uh, essentially um, expands what would be the duty of care beyond that of contractual relationships and to that of um, uh, uh, anybody that you may have a duty of care towards. And we'll see how that is defined in this case in a second. So Donahue and Stevenson is a case that takes place in 1932, and the facts of this case are as follows. Mrs. Donahue and one of her friends would allegedly visit a cafe by the name of Minchella. The reason why I'm saying allegedly here is because the legal principles at stake did not actually pertain to whether or not the factual um, matter had been tested or had even um, uh, or, or were even necessarily true. Um, so we put allegedly there because uh, one of the nice little interesting factoids that you may not know about about Donahue and Stevenson is that the evidence, the facts on the the facts that were established on the evidence were not actually shown to be the case. Okay, now, now that's not to say that they didn't happen. I'm just saying that at, at trial they didn't actually um, it, these things didn't actually occur because the most important issue was the legal element of this case, the legal element that ultimately um, expands the duty of care beyond that of contractual relationships. Regardless, assuming that it's all true, Ms. Donahue and one of her friends would allegedly visit a cafe by the name of Minchella. At the cafe, a, the friend of Mrs. Donahue would purchase for her a ginger beer float, which would arrive in an opaque bottle. Okay, so they did not see what was inside the bottle. Mrs. Donahue would then drink some of the ginger beer before her friend discovered, upon topping the rest of the drink out, that there was inside the bottle a decomposed snail, or a decomposing snail. Okay, not a particularly nice thing to find in a bottle that you just drank from. And Mrs. Donahue agreed. She claimed, therefore, that upon seeing the snail, knowing that she drank from the bottle where the snail was, um, that she had then become ill as a result. Now, the issue of litigation here, you might think straight away, well, this is clearly an element of um, the people who um, uh, maybe manufactured the bottle or maybe, maybe sold the bottle to Mrs. Donahue uh, would um, be liable somewhere. Well, the issue of litigation for here is who could Mrs. Donahue sue? Because on the one hand, she couldn't necessarily sue the cafe because she had not had a contractual relationship with them. Don't remember, don't forget, sorry, the friend of Mrs. Donahue purchased the ginger beer float for her. So they had the contractual relationship. Mrs. Donahue did not. Okay. So there was no contractual relationship between Mrs. Donahue and Minchella. And so the result of that was that the traditional understanding of the duty of care as being one that existed between contractual relationships could not essentially be formulated in this in this case. In addition to this, the, the uh, Minchella were as in the dark as anybody else because of the fact that they had not inspected the bottles, nor could they have been reasonably expected to inspect the bottles. And so because they were opaque bottles, they just assumed that everything was OK when they sold the, the bottle to um, Mrs. Donahue's friend. So even if there wasn't this issue of there being no contractual relationship with Minchella, let's say it was Mrs. Donahue who had purchased the uh, the bottle of ginger beer, it is unlikely that Minchella would have been liable anyway, given the fact that they were not reasonably expected to check every single bottle, which would involve opening and then resealing them, um, especially when the bottles are opaque and you couldn't see inside or what was inside. So as a result of this, Mrs. Donahue decided and to sue the manufacturers of the bottle. So she would uh, make a claim against the manufacturer. She would ultimately win the claim against, her manu against the manufacturer. And this is very interesting because she did not have a contractual relationship with the manufacturer. There was no relationship in law necessarily that existed between Mrs. Donahue and the manufacturer. And so this was seemingly a relatively innocuous decision uh, which was made by the House of Lords. However, the words of Lord Atkin in the um, in the obiter of uh, on, in in his obiter um, actually enshrines one of the most important principles within the duty of care, and so this is really what we take on and and carry on for the rest of um, the series, looking at the concept of the duty of care. This is known as the neighbor principle, and this is what expands the duty of care beyond that of a contractual relationship to well your neighbor essentially. They say here that the rule that you are to love your neighbour becomes in law that you must not injure your neighbour. 
and the lawyer's question, who is my neighbour, receives a restricted reply. You must take reasonable care to avoid acts or omissions which you could reasonably foresee would be likely to injure your neighbour. Then who in law is my neighbour? The answer seems to be, persons who are so closely and directly affected by my acts that I ought reasonably to have them in contemplation as being so affected when I am directing my mind to the acts or omissions which are called into question. This is the neighbour principle. And what does it tell us? Well, it states um, that there are two component parts to the idea of the neighbour principle. We'll get to them in a second because they're, uh, in the passage at least, these are the idea of reasonable foreseeability and proximity. And you can see this in the passage, okay? So the um, the first part, reasonable foreseeability, we can see as we go on to line three. You must take reasonable care to avoid acts or omissions which you can, quote, reasonably foresee would be likely to injure your neighbour, okay? So that is... Assuming that we know who the neighbour is, there is this principle of reasonable foreseeability that you have to take into consideration. The second part of this passage then asks the question, who is then the neighbour? Okay, so assuming we know who the neighbour is, we can apply reasonable foreseeability. But before that, if we don't know who the neighbour is, we have to think about what the neighbour, who the neighbour may be. The answer according to uh, Lord Atkin here, seems to be persons who are so closely and directly affected by my act that I ought reasonably to have them in contemplation as being so affected when I'm directing my mind to the acts or omissions which are called into question. This, therefore, is the second element. This is the proximity element of um, the neighbour principle. Your neighbour is somebody who you are proximate to, who you are so closely and directly um, affected by my act um, as such that they would should be reasonably in the back of my mind when I'm thinking about the things that I'm doing. Okay, those two things establishes reasonable proxim uh, reasonable foreseeability, sorry, and the idea of proximity. So then, these two elements in the neighbour principle essentially expands this idea of a duty of care that previously only existed in contractual relationships, and so therefore the scope of litigation was particularly narrow, to anybody. Essentially, it could be anybody, so long as you fulfil the principles of the neighbour principle, so long as you fulfil the idea of reasonable foreseeability on the one hand and proximity on the other. Where those elements are said to exist, these are where we get this idea of a duty of care that can arise. And this is a legal duty of care, just as legal as any duty of care that could exist within contractual relationships. So this led to an, ex an incredible expansion of the law of tort. This was only the obiter, by the way, of the um, Donahue and Stevenson principle, but the neighbor, uh, the neighbor principle and the, the language of the neighbor principle would then be picked up and then form parts of the, the, the ratio decidendi of other case judgments. Okay, so even if it wasn't necessarily that applicable in this case, it was still nevertheless applicable as time went on. So, as I mentioned, this leads to an incredible expansion of the law of tort, since it expands the scope of the first major elements, okay? So, going back then, let's think about the opening of the door of the Donahue and Stevenson principle, um, but think about the ways in which we can expand this and see how this has developed over the next, um, uh, as an expansion, over the, the next 30, 40, 50 years, okay? We actually see something of an expansion and then, a, interestingly, a bit of a contraction in the principle of, con as the, of the duty of care as it develops, okay? And so let's begin with a, a development in this area in the case of Hedley, Byrne and Heller from 1964. Now, this is a case that you may be familiar with if you have studied already the, the law of contracts. And it is also a case that you're going to have to be familiar with when we think about negligent misstatement in future lessons time. In this case, the claimants um, were an advertising agency and they were looking for information about the potentiality of one of their clients. They, they, could, they were thinking of taking on a particular client and they wanted to know if that client was credit worthy. OK, so did they, they did a basic background check, a basic reference check on the credit worthiness of this potential client. The client was a company by the name of Easy Power. In, in order to ascertain this information, they got the information from the potential client's bank, the defendant. And the bank 
gave them a favorable credit reference. They gave Easy Power a favorable credit reference. And it was this decision that incentivized the claimant to enter into a contract with Easy Power. However, in reality, what happened was Easy Power would go into liquidation not long after, and the claimant would lose around fifteen thousand pounds. As a result of this, as a result of this loss, they believed that they were entitled to uh, reparation. They were entitled to compensation from the bank. They sued the bank for negligence for negligently misstating um, a, 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 a factual circumstance. Um, to them which then incentivized them to 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 make a financial obligation which led to them losing money that is essentially what negligent misstatement is in a nutshell we'll get to it in more detail in future lessons though it was held that the defendant was not liable in negligence ultimately um the response from the bank was uh, upon the request of information actually did include a uh, a disclaimer about um the information that they had um, been given the information um, the the, uh, the the disclaimer sorry said for your private use and without responsibility on the part of the bank or, or of its officials. So they made the conclusion, they came to the conclusion that the bank was not liable owing to this disclaimer. However, had the disclaimer not existed, uh, but for the issuance of this disclaimer, if you will, the bank would have been negligent for the statement that had been made. And so what we see here is a, a, a bit of an expansion, a bit of an expansion in the duty of care, um, the duty to take care uh, on the part of the bank in the in, in the in the in the in the statements that were potentially going to um, have um, financial repercussions in terms of um, in terms of the response from the claimants. The only reason why this was not a case that led to a judgment in favor of the claimant was this disclaimer, which and these disclaimers aren't necessarily too um, too prominent, nor are they necessarily uh, particularly useful in in today's um, in today's common commercial um, contracts and, and 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 commercial situations, owing to the fact that there is a restriction in these kinds of disclaimers owing to legislation. A further case illustrates an expansion of the duty of care even further. This idea of um, the duty of care as enshrined in the case from 1970 of Home Office versus Dorset Yacht Corporation. So what the importance that we think about here is, is the fact that the duty of care is actually imposed on a defendant for the actions of third parties. Okay, The defendants being the Home Office, claimants being Dorset Yacht Corporation, the Home Office had established a borstal. Um, a, a borstal, for those who don't know, is just a, a place for young offenders to go and work. Um, uh, and those trainees, the, those young offenders who had been working in this borstal, um, or had been working as part of the borstal, um, had been working at a harbour. They were once and um, beyond um, the, the, the duties of the officers, left unsupervised by their officers. Um, this represented a breach of their instructions. One night, these young, um, these young offenders escaped, and then while they were unsupervised, they went and caused some damage to a yacht which was moored up in the harbour. And so the question here was: Was the Home Office liable for the negligence, um, uh, in negligence for the actions that had been performed by a third party? Okay, their negligence would arise out of a breach of their duty of care to ensure that these young offenders did not cause damage to the harbour or to any um, boats or yachts that were in the harbour. But the the actions that would have led to the damage were not actions that were committed by the Home Office. They would have been actions that were committed by um, a third party, the third party being the young offenders who had been under the supervision or the supposed supervision of these um, officers. It, it was held that a duty of care did exist between the home office and the owner of a yacht. There was proximity since they were working in the harbour, so that represented the fact that they were the neighbour of the uh, home office in this regard. And it was reasonably foreseeable that something like this could have happened if the things that uh, if they were left unsupervised. So if the breach had happened, it was reasonably foreseeable that something like this could have happened. Now, the idea of reasonable foreseeability does not require such a high standard such that you have to have uh, uh, known that it would definitely happen if the if you breached your duty of care. The the officers didn't have to know that it would definitely have happened, that the damage would have definitely occurred if they had breached their duty. All it has to be is reasonably foreseeable. 
okay? Uh, maybe you could um, describe it as not beyond the realms of possibility, okay? Um, being something that a reasonable person could foresee might happen in these circumstances. And if you can satisfy that principle, then you have satisfied a duty of care. Finally, then, let's look at the case of 1978 of Anson Merton LBC. In this case, the claimants were the lessees of a block of flats, um, and these block of flats ultimately had some faulty foundations. The faulty foundations would ultimately lead to a number of cracks in the buildings themselves, and the, the foundations um, obviously very important for the building of the flats. Merton LBC was therefore sued for a breach of their statutory duty in approving the foundations where it was clear that they were not deep enough to cause this damage. Okay? And, uh, or, and would cause this damage, should I say. So they approved the foundations. Um, it was very clear that the foundations were not deep enough. And so these cracks would inevitably have taken place. Lord Wilberforce would therefore then develop what is known as the two-stage test for establishing or trying to make determinations as to where a duty of care may exist in these circumstances. He says, the first question that you will ask is, is there a sufficient amount of proximity or neighbourhood between the claimant and the defendant such that the defendant should reasonably foresee that their actions would likely cause damage to the claimant? This is essentially uh, a reworded, uh, reformulated idea of the neighbour principle all the way back in Don Donahue and Stevenson just established here. OK, because the neighbourhood principle is all here. OK, there is reasonable foreseeability and there's proximity. The second question is, are there any considerations which may limit or negate the duty of care to be found? This essentially uh, requires there to be an establishment of neighbourhood principle, but then uh, the ability for um, the court to be able to, uh, to, to alter the existence of a duty of care on the basis of other considerations that may arise in a factual case-by-case uh, -case circumstance. Now, one of the things that I should note and that we will get to in future lessons is that this case would be um, altered and the claim for actionable damage would later be rejected um, by the case of Murphy and Brentwood, D.C. in 1991. But we'll get to how the duty of care is established in today's modern conceptions um, in the next lesson, as well as looking at how duty of care is, uh, will arise out of novel circumstances. All of that will be considered in the next lesson.